We've done it. That's so sad. It's not. It's not a hand check, Stan. Get it together. Max, I know we have some Sonic cosplayers in our audience, but I don't think they understand Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, we need to verify this. This is it's important. So we're gonna give you a quiz. We're going to yeah. We're going to show you um, someone, and you're going to tell us whether or not they are a Sonic the Hedgehog character, OK? This is really easy. If they're a Sonic the Hedgehog character, raise your hand. If they are prepared not, to tell us who they are. Yeah, if they are not a Sonic the Hedgehog character, do not raise your hand. This is very simple. Someone's going to fuck it up. <laughs> yeah, don't raise a foot, please, or anything else. Oh, yeah, see, you'll get it right. Yeah, you'll do great. The rest of the people I don't trust, but what you, about, you're good. What about the two hands? One hand! <laughs> see, you are the problem child. Is this a Sonic, wait, this isn't on. <laughs> is this a Sonic the Hedgehog character? <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, which one is it, blue shirt? <laughs> yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Robotic garbage. Cybertruck ain't got shit on my Cybertruck, which actually does have a boat mode and an island busting laser on it. Let's go. I, yeah, I'm with him. Honestly, yeah, let, let's swap out King K. Rule. That was scripted. Please, no one else do that. Right. <laughs> Is the Jolly Green Giant a Sonic the Hedgehog character? No. Wait. Luffy. No. Also, Dr. Robotnik. <laughs> this is Robotnik, that was Eggman. They're different characters. See, I'm an expert. Because we actually like Jim Carrey, he did both of those roles. Next is Toru from Jackie Chan Adventures, a, a Sonic the Hedgehog character. Uh, Sam, you know no, all these yeah. answers. We're not calling Sam, you're like the only one with your hand up. You know the answer. Yeah. Is it Eggman again? No. <laughs> Good try, though. He's got the right figure. <laughs> but no. I haven't seen this panel, Max. Okay, Chris. I... Is it Bigger the Cat? No, it's Big the Cat. <laughs> Not to be confused with my OC, Bigger the Catter. <laughs> Do not steal. If you notice, he is slightly bigger. <laughs> He's very edgy. I love him so much. Next is the Sailor Moon AMV for crawling in my skin, a Sonic the Hedgehog character. Yeah. What? You, yeah. yes, yeah. which one? Uh, Thomas, help me out here. No, no, oh, never mind. No, no, no. Okay, no. Uh, orange hair, curly hair. Oh, God. You raised your hand. You did this to yourself. We warned you. Um, Pick one. <laughs> yeah. Who? These people actually, don't know anything. Actual Sonic characters. Yeah. No. 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 Yeah. Jesus fucking Christ! It's Shadow the Hedgehog. <laughs> How is this difficult for you? <laughs> Nothing's more edgy. Come on. <laughs> We're not done with the quiz, but I've lost so much faith. <laughs> None of these people are Clayton, are fans. you preemptively raising your hand? This is still Craig Sonic fans. No. Craig is the father. <laughs> Is Pacific Gas and Electric a Sonic the Hedgehog character? Yeah. Wait. As a Sonic? Yeah, thank you. She's fucking gorgeous. Someone finally got it. Yeah, go that guy. Oh, that's cheating. Jesus Christ. Disappointed. Well, I mean, I can't rely on anyone else, so that's fair. Okay. Is that moment you realize that you are sexually attracted to anthropomorphic cartoon characters a Sonic the Hedgehog character? Yes. Yes. My favorite answer to that question was, it depends on your preferences. <laughs> and when pressed, he said, Rouge the Bat. Didn't he also say Knuckles? No, he said Rouge the Bat. Someone else said Knuckles. Okay, so clearly... Outside of like that one guy, 
No one know, here knows shit about Sonic, which is upsetting, because you're cosplaying a character, and you failed the test. You didn't raise, no. Do you, do you have a microphone right now and a PowerPoint in an audience? No, you don't. You have no authority in this room. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we wrote it. Why is that a problem? It's not. So, uh, we have to start from the beginning. We do, they don't know anything. A long time ago, there was a company called Sega. Sega got their start selling gambling machines at naval bases. Basically, you know, they just loot crated the US Army. It was pretty cool. Uh, the problem is, at some point, the Navy went, uh, maybe maybe uh, we shouldn't let sailors gamble their earnings. We should really only let them gamble their lives. What? And um, they banned venereal diseases. So they, they banned the loot crates. But um, Sega was just still really into sailors and machines. So they released their first uh, full cabinet game, which is called Periscope. This is basically the predecessor to the Virtual Boy, uh, because it's really uncomfortable to use. You just put your head in the Periscope, you look around, and you sink boats. Uh, this thing was fucking huge, and it cost 25 cents to play. I know what you're saying. 25 cents, that's standard arcade cabinet prices. It's only standard arcade cabinet prices because Periscope charged a quarter, and everyone else went, wait a minute, we can charge people 25 cents to play Asteroids? Let's do it. It was like a nickel before that. So, seeing success in the video game market, Sega has decided they're going to commit to the bit. And like any other uh, cabinet manufacturer in the 80s decided to release their first video game console. And nobody cared. Uh, the Sega SG-1000 didn't sell particularly well, but that didn't stop Sega because they full, pulled the first OC Do Not Steal and just kept recoloring the thing and re-releasing it. Hell, they even released a Sega Master Girl. Finally, <laughs> women can play video games. I would like to note, uh, these controllers that you plug in, this, the console's a controller. Good luck. <laughs> Um, so with, you know, the fact that Sega had, I don't know, like 632 different variants of one console, uh, their sales were pretty well, uh, went pretty well, as you can sell, tell, they did, uh, they made a lot of sales in Western Europe, Western Japan, and of course, Brazil, which accounted for 8 million of their console sales. Europe was 7. Uh, I know, right? So, and also, even though they were outsold pretty seriously by Nintendo, the Sega Master System had the highest attachment rate of video, any video game console, wherein the average person who owned the console owned 22 games. Whoa. For reference, for the NES, it's eight. Yeah, that's how shitty Sega games were. You needed 22 to make up for Nintendo's eight. Um, but you might be wondering, why did this sell so well in Brazil? It's honestly pretty simple. And I need to be clear, this is not a joke. Sega outsourced the marketing of their consoles internationally to Tonka, the company that sells trucks. What does Tonka and Brazil, what do Tonka and Brazilians have in common? An absolute hatred of rainforests. <laughs> Which, and now here's where it becomes a joke again. I assume that with each SD-1000 you purchase, they would bulldoze a full acre. So with that, um, and yeah, right? Yay, deforestation. Mm. Don't fucking clap, oh my god. First they failed the Sonic, and now they're failing environmentalism. Hashtag <laughs> acceleration, but only, acceleration, but only for climate change. <laughs> I hate these fucking people so much. We even know that one. We hate them too. Thanks, Dad. So, uh, let's talk about the Sega Genesis, the yeah. follow-up to the, the Sega Master System, because you know, they're like, we're doing well, we've got a console, and it's got one of the best mascots of all time as the pack-in game upon release. You know him, you love him, it's Sonic the... Yeah. 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 That's, uh, 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 Andrew? Whoa, yes, wait, I still have slides. That's a, that's a furry. Yeah, this, this is definitely where I mean, Sega started their obsession with furries. I mean, I know, I know Sonic's also a furry. This was like, the pack-in game for, for the Genesis for a while. Wait a minute. So, like, we're gonna, we're gonna go against Nintendo one-on-one. -on -one. They've got Mario. Yep. Pack-in game. We're going to put in this thing 
that basically anyone who has a child under 15, the parents can be like, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, how, so no one bought it. Uh, they had to get this one guy, I don't know, his name's like... Tom Steve, Kolansky? Steve Jobs, yeah, Tom Kolansky. <laughs> it, it, I definitely didn't forget his name. Uh, he worked for Mattel. His whole thing was selling Barbie dolls. And I know what you're saying, that, that seems pretty easy, they're Barbie dolls. Um, he was selling Barbie dolls back when people didn't know what Barbie dolls were, because they were like the first dolls with boobs. The people are weird. So think about how fucking weird parents are right now about the books their kids read in a middle school library. And then just imagine that, but a doll with boobs. He got past that, and he was able to uh, sell Sega consoles. So, do you want to talk about that weird blue thing that this panel is definitely not about? Yeah, so okay, now cool. we're going to talk about the birth of the hedgehog. And please, we googled this so you never, never have to. Um, <laughs> so, we were talking about a lot of pregnant characters earlier. Uh, and Shrek is always the father. So Sega was deciding they needed to try to one-up Nintendo, because they wanted to get that market share. So Nintendo had a great poster boy for their console in Mario. Uh, not that one. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag not Mario. Yeah, so, but when you see Mario, you recognize him, you know what consoles they get if you want to play him. But who did Sega have at the time? They had Alex the Kid? Wait, wait. Does anybody genuinely know who Alex the Kid is? I'm sorry. Wow, I can't believe this many people are lying right now. Yeah. <laughs> if you know Everyone you know, with your hand. I grew up with Sega. Yeah, that was my first console, too. Yeah. But, so you know that Alex the Kid can't cut a slice of bread, let alone, let alone the video game industry. So Sega knew they had to come up with something new. So they decided to go for the opposite approach from Mario. So Mario's slow, our character has to be fast. <laughs> Mario uses two buttons? Well, we only need one button, because we all know nobody uses more than one key. That's why the paint rubbed off your W key. Uh, Mario's red, so our character has to be blue and have a crippling cookie addiction. I think it was Chili Dogs. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. They both start with a C. Mario, uh, very wholesome. So Sonic has to be edgy as shit. Look, it's you! <laughs> So, Mario fights animals. Sonic hurts them in a much more roundabout way. <laughs> Mario had a terrible movie. Don't say that. Yeah. Things a master. And the Sonic movies were so much worse before they even fixed it. They were trying to one-up them in the wrong direction. Mario, timeless. Sonic did at the moment he came out. So, but where did they come up with the concept, like, design for Sonic? Well, they took Mickey Mouse and they slapped Felix the cat's head on. Wait, that I was thought, literally the character design. Wait, I thought there was supposed to be an animation there. There's no, you didn't change the image. No, that, that's it. That's Sonic. Wait, wait. Yeah. Really, really kind of much I don't see it. All right, so. And they, and they had some great ideas. They called him Mr. Needle Mouse and, had, and gave him a human girlfriend because that's that's what people want out of Sonic. Wait, wait, we found the one like physics collision that works in the game. She can't fall through his arms. Right, but why did they pick a hedgehog for the flagship character? I guess they're kind of cool and cute, so okay, but. But let's look at this other cast. They got they got a fox, <laughs> and they made up some animal called an echidna. That's not a real animal. And then they just raided the zoo. It's like, uh, like a crocodile, armadillo, bat, rabbit, hawk, whatever chow are. I think I think uh, the film We Bought a Zoo is the predecessor to this yeah. this game franchise. But. Then they actually had to make a game for this character. And that's where they honestly didn't do a terrible job, because they kind of created a new platforming genre. Because at the time, platforming was very slow, methodical. You had to like time your jumps and problem solve. But Sonic did very different from that, because it was about learning through repetition and going fast. Because going fast puts you on the higher paths, which were shorter. But to get on those higher paths, you had to make jumps and going fast, you were gonna fail those jumps like the first 20, 30 times. So you had to do it many times to get good. So you could go those fast paths. So it was really I, honestly kind of unique. It gave you a sense of speed. I really like the, the slow set of giggles as people read the text <laughs> on the slide. There, there, was a, there was a time where this entire, entire panel was structured around the Cold War. Yeah. This is like one of two remnants left from that time. But, 
point, they did come up with an interesting like concept for the game, like the story not breaking any uh, breaking any ground. So you know, evil villain takes cute animals, shoves them into robots, and magic stones save the day. You know, standard. <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and they really didn't change the formula. They just added my, the second playable character in Nine Tails, um, and the spin dash, so you could actually kill enemies while you were moving. Um, also, they named him Miles Prowers in Japan, so like a Miles Prower joke. And then the only country that uses Miles Prower is the U.S., and they couldn't, we couldn't stomach that, so they had to rename him to Tails. Why? Why were we sensitive about that? We should be sensitive about things like guns, not that. We don't care about those. Um, it was also one of the first games with a global release date, so just everyone got it at the same time. And then we had Sonic 3, which came out in America before Japan. For USA! Japan. USA! 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 So, Fucking proud boys in here. It was designed as one game in two parts, <laughs> and the soundtrack was going to be made with a certain famous musician, but... The musician turned out to be noted child diddler. Uh, sorry, no, 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 no. wrong, wrong child diddler. No, allegedly, allegedly. Yeah, there we go. So deep in production, the allegations started to come out. Uh, so they clearly redid all the music, by which I mean they just removed his name and said, "OC, do not steal." It's our music now. <laughs> So, Sonic 3 was where they some Jesus juice? kind of expanded the formula a little bit, like, larger levels, added a story. It started out as a 3D game, which got cut due to budget constraints, and the 3D part got split out and became Sonic 3D Blast, which was not a blast. Um, so the other half then became Sonic 3, which then got cut again due to budget constraints, first half being Sonic 3, second half being it Sonic and Knuckles, who can finally show us the way. This is where I would like to know. This was my first Sonic game. I didn't know what to do, so I just went back to playing Tiny Toon Adventures. <laughs> so, they felt that the Game Genie was getting too much of that market space, so they made it a lock-on adapter, but they had to ask, what happened if you, so you could lock it on like the older Sonic games and replace a character with Knuckles? It was great. But then they asked, what happens if you, if you do this to a non-Sonic game? Well, it, obviously it has to replace a character with Knuckles, so they made it work with the entire library, like, Toe Jam and Earl? No, no, Toe Jam, toe jam and Knuckles. <laughs> we got Earthworm Jim? No, Earthworm Knuckles. <laughs> it even worked with VR chat. <laughs> so, if you have a successful character in like the 90s and 80s, what do you do with it to make more money, Max? Well, I want to see if the audience has an idea. Right, what, what's ideas? a good way to commercialize something? Yes. <laughs> okay, so here's, yeah, yeah, here's how we milk family. Sonic's tits. All right, they milk Sonic by making television shows of him. First one was The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. We're pretty sure this was the CIA of first experimenting well with LSD, because oh my goodness, they need to turn down that dose. This entire show was a giant acid trip, like nonsensical backgrounds, plots that made no sense. How did they come up with this? Like, just, he just got really messy with his chocolate bar. I don't know what the problem is. And then, like, we got weird adventures, like Sonic falls in love with a robot. Eggman joins the wor uh, world German Air Corps right before World War One. And then um, Sonic gets really into Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> you couldn't make that today. And, and they decided Jaleel Whitefoot voice him. Like, sure, it worked out in the end, but when I think fast and cool, I don't think Steve Urkel. <laughs> The fun thing, at the end of every episode, they did a nice PSA for the kids. You know, like, look one way when crossing the freeway. Don't put your head in a blender. Uh, if the dog's mouth is foaming, let your little brother pet it first. <laughs> it was good for kids. By the way, Sam, I need you to pet a dog for me later. You need to make sure, thanks. And then, and then next, in the same year, they came out with Sonic the Hedgehog. Also, um, the drugs were out of their system because this was good. Uh, so it honestly, it had a storyline. It gave a reason why Sonic was fighting against Eggman. It really like flushed out the world, tech dystopia. And it was honestly really interesting. It was like eighth in, I think, the uh, Saturday morning cartoon shows for the era. So it was pretty popular. People really liked it. In fact, it was so unique and fun that the Archie comics just picked it up and ran with it. Like they just took that world and ran with it. And the Archie comics went on for like 200 and... 90 issues, I think it was, before they finally their license swapped over to IDW, but they had the world record for the longest franchise-based comic series for quite a long time. So, I mean, people really liked it. It was really good. And then they decided to go back on the drugs. <laughs> yeah, 
Sonic Underground. I think it's really funny that there's a clear disconnect between the people who are clearly younger than you and you. Yes. And how that is received. So this one was like a Star Wars ripoff of the time, like twin and triplets separated at birth. Uh, instead of magic force powers, it's power of music and hard rock. But yeah. everything about this was a dumpster fire. There was no redeeming quality. So it's just a bad version. Maybe the guitar. So it's just a bad version of Boshi the Rock. Yes. Okay. Thank you. They're, they're all voiced by the same voice actress as Bochi. That checks out. <laughs> They're all, they're all Jaleel White. Yeah. All three of them are Jaleel White. You know, you know what else Jaleel White voiced? The Sega Genesis itself. <laughs> I'm kidding, that's just a transition. So, with Sonic Mania sweeping the nation uh, in the early 90s, much like AIDS, uh, <laughs> how, well, how well did the console sell? Uh, pretty, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, the Genesis came out two years before the Super Nintendo. And honestly, you couldn't tell by the sales figures because Super Nintendo caught it immediately. But once uh, Sega stopped competing with, you know, a children's toy, the NES. Yeah, once they stopped packing in Altered Beast. Yeah, once they stopped packing in Altered Beast, they did really well in the international market. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? Here's Japan. <laughs> oh, this is the market oh, wow. Sega actually cared about. This was outsold by the TurboGrafx-16. <laughs> and as you can tell by the response, no one knows what the TurboGrafx-16 is. But there are two of you. Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's not good, Chief. Uh, the Sega Genesis still had a really high attachment rate, selling uh, 16 games per console compared to Super Nintendo's eight. But you know, that's again, because they all suck, except Sonic, which I guess is fine, but you had to buy two copies to play Sonic 3. Uh, but with such a good cash cow going on, Sega decided they were really gonna milk that thing. So uh, their first edition for it is of course the 32X. When applied to the Sega Genesis, it looks much like this. <laughs> so uh, the cool thing about the 32X, it lets you play in 32 bits. The bad thing about it, literally everything else. Uh -huh. uh, this was designed as initially as a standalone stopgap console between the Genesis and the Saturn. But then the Saturn development started picking up, so they went, oh, we don't, we don't need a 32-bit console in between. The Saturn is going super well. We'll touch on that later. But they really liked the idea of a 32-bit console, so they ended up making this edition for the Genesis, and it was released in America after the Saturn was released in Japan. Why would you buy this? The Saturn's coming out next year. And like five people did. Uh, the day it came out, it actually met sales expectations, and by the end of the month, they were in clearance bins. Uh, next edition is, of course, the Sega CD. When it fixed to a Sega Genesis, it looks much like this. <laughs> now, some of you were alive in the early 90s and remember what video games were like. I'm only one of those two things. But um, basically, there was a big thing of making like live action cutscenes in video games for some reason, but it could only be on disc-based uh, storage devices. So this just exists so you can play Night Trap <laughs> and listen to music. Honestly, it's fine, I guess. Next, the Sega VR. Uh, if you're wondering why no one has one, that's because it never released. Tom Kalansky went in, looked at this thing, and went, this is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> the company that designed it then went on to make the Virtual Boy. That is not a joke. <laughs> Next up, uh, my favorite my favorite console edition, I think you'll all love it, it's the karaoke add-on. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Japan only. Japan only, oh. where, you know, when there were, there were like eight Genesis's out there, and all of them had the karaoke add-on. Uh, and then, the weirdest thing I found is the Sega Tetra Drive, which is a fully functioning computer slash Sega Genesis. What? Would you care to guess how much this cost when it came out in 1991? 50, no, what? No, that's how much it costs now. What? Huh? 1100. What? Yeah. 1991 money. So yeah, about $2,500 now. Now here's the thing, like, computers were really expensive back then. If this actually came with the monitor and keyboard, it is probably not the worst deal on the planet. It's, a better than Apple, it's just a moderately bad deal. 
Um, so this is kind of what a Sega Genesis fully stacked looks. And this really reminds me of like one of those Sears rental, like, you know, mail order houses where like, you know, oh, this year, honey, we'll get the patio. And we know how that kind of uh, business model worked out for Sears. <laughs> But I mean, you can you can basically play Legos with these things, so it's pretty cool. Too bad when you turn it on, it does this. I had to do the joke twice. Next, everyone's favorite Sega console, the garbage can. So going into the Sega Saturn, Sega had a lot of goodwill, and they were really ready to squander it. First, they met with Project Reality, the people who designed the N64. Again, this is not a joke. The people who did the N64, Tom Kalansky had in the process of making a deal for them to design the Saturn. When he went to Sega of Japan and went, hey, we've got people who can make us a console, Sega of Japan went, are they American? And we went, yes, and then they went, never mind. <laughs> because again, they weren't doing well in Japan, so they were trying to prioritize that market. It did not work out for them, obviously. But that's what happened. So Tom Kalansky gave them Nintendo's number, and uh, now we have the N64. Next, they tried to work with uh, Sony to make a disc-based console. Uh, and they got pretty far in the contract process for this too, until they read the fine print and realized that they were absolutely fucking themselves. Uh, Sega was entirely convinced that they had a better uh, game licensing scheme than Sony. And um, that's not gonna happen. So uh, they bailed on this deal too, and Sony definitely didn't enter the market out of spite five minutes later. Yeah. Uh, so those are the, the, the business plans they made that were bad. Uh, now let's go into the hardware. Like the fact that this thing has two discrete yeah. CPUs. Yeah, yeah they, they saw, yeah, you can't do that in the 90s. They saw a tech demo of the PS1 and went, oh shit. So they basically taped a second disc in there, which made it <laughs> terrible to design for. They also used quadrilaterals instead of triangles like every other console. So it was, again, very hard to program for and very difficult to do a clean port of a game over. So Sega Saturn couldn't get a lot of multi-plat console uh, launches. Next, uh, they t decided to turn E3 into a surprise launch party <laughs> where um, that Sega went up and went like, hey, everybody, look under your seat. No, there's not a Sega Saturn. We didn't make enough, but you can buy them in the stores now. Uh, they forgot to tell many of the stores. No, they didn't tell anybody. They just went, hey, have at it, you filthy animals. KB Toys didn't get any gen uh, Saturns because they just didn't make enough. So KB Toys then refused to carry Sega products going forward. <laughs> I miss it. I miss it. Um, yeah, so also there were like five games that came out and then no more games came out until the original launch date because they did not tell any of their game developers <laughs> that the launch date was getting moved. Uh, uh, someone who was really stupid. So uh, how, how did this, w oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Oh, you could play these games and then there were no more games. Sorry, I forgot that was a slide. Um, so this kind of led us to the first unscheduled rapid disassembly of a video game console ever seen. <laughs> Also, this is what its controller looks like. Oh. That, that's a Walkman, right? I yeah, can put a is, CD in that. Yeah, you can put it. Right? That is a Walkman. Um, they also used Ice Cube to sell it. Oh my god. So that's cool. Why is there what? I don't know. Uh, look, they saw what the N64 was doing and, we, and said we can be dumber than that. <laughs> this pre no, I think the N64 saw this and went, we can be dumber than that. This is where I was going to put the rapid disassembly joke. But it only disassembled in America. Uh, in Japan, it did pretty well, mostly because they had this guy going around who was going to kick people. And if you did not buy and play a Sega Saturn, Sega Ta Senshiro was going to go and kick your ass personally. And frankly, I didn't want to get the shit beaten out of me by that man. Yeah. And the best thing about the Saturn, right, was of course the Sonic game on it, right? Yeah, they didn't put a Sonic game on it because yeah, it was failing that badly. Yeah. So uh, we just skip to the Dreamcast, right? Yeah! So <laughs> it was just kind of there. Honestly, I'm with you. Okay, so I know that this sold 10 million units and Sega abandoned the console market after it. But 
It was a $200 console. It wasn't quite up to PS2 levels, but that's fine. It was $100 cheaper. You could do four-player local, local multiplayer. You had online capabilities. Uh, you could pirate the shit out of it. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. pretty good final console. Too bad no one had faith in Sega anymore, and the PS2 was coming out in a year and had a DVD player in it. Damn. Yeah, so now that we've gotten through the old consoles, we can talk about modern Sonic. Now with 3Ds, uh, so we start with Sonic Adventure, and I quote, they wanted to make everything fresh and new, so new, edgy designs, and we can see how well that worked out. I'll, I'll be honest, Sonic looks like he's gonna eat my face. <laughs> so, and they wanted to make new, inventive gameplay experiences. Uh, like fishing, a whole campaign on it. Because uh, when I buy a game about like running fast in the blue blur, I, w I wanna go fishing. I heard they only did the fishing part because some dev had like rigged up like a fishing rod in engine. They're like, oh, that's great. Let's not waste that work that guy did. <laughs> Obviously screwing off. So uh, yeah, they just like, all right, make a campaign on it. And then, then they added on rail shooter section. Or, yeah. Guys, we wanna run fast. What are you doing? <laughs> well, the bullets go fast. Uh, next. I hate, I hate, I just hate how the reaction's gonna be for this slide. Next, we have Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. <laughs> battle. The GameCube edition this is, is the, the game only one version. This isn't the Dreamcast. But... Dreamcast was dead and you know it. No one cared. This, this is, okay, no one played Sonic Adventure 2. Everyone played Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. I stand by this statement, you're not a real person. <laughs> now, here's the thing. All of you are pretty excited, and Metacritic agrees with you. It has an 89, but like, it's not a great no, story, to be honest. Th this, okay, yeah, I get why you're into it. <laughs> but let's be honest, outside of some fun cringe dialogue, City Escape, and the Chow Garden, what else does this game have to offer? I said some cringe dialogue. That's all you need! Maria! <laughs> this is at best a 69 nice. Alright, and their next 3D game was of course Sonic Heroes. Because they decided they had to slam all the season and everything. Oh god. People are applauding Sonic. I never thought that would happen. I mean, the rumored fifth team was just gonna be your dad and his two coworkers. They just made everyone a team at this point. Like, uh, they didn't expand the formula. They made you stick three characters instead of one now. Come on, we just wanted to run fast. Why is that so hard to get? And you know, after people were, you know, re understandably disappointed with Sonic Heroes, they decided they were gonna go in a brand new direction. An edgy direction. Oh, yeah. What if we gave a hedgehog a gun? Yeah! <laughs> yeah! 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 Because yeah, I don't. I don't think there's anything more to say on this. I, I mean, think you guys already know all about it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And then we had uh, Sonic 06. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> You all know how buggy that game was. You'd agree with me if you weren't too busy clipping into the floor. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they had great design decisions, like that human girlfriend part that we remember from the original concept. Why did they bring that forward and nothing else? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what people want. <laughs> all right, and then well, we had something the slightly better, because the bar was negative and into the floor. Well, they well, added so collision, so it was a because werehog does not mean a hedgehog turning into a wolf. That means a human turning into a hedgehog. Did nobody own a dictionary on that dev team? But finally, daytime levels. Those were great. Run fast. Great speed. Like, amazing level design. But then the nighttime sections. Oh, no. Like, they take, like, an hour to get through, like, a single level. That's why it's a slow beat-em-up. Oh, the Knuckles levels from SA2B weren't even this bad. Those would have been better. And then um, they did what basically everyone did in like the late aughts, early teens, and get really into Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> but 
honestly, and they just decided to try to do everything because they just made a lot of Sonic games. Some were good, some were bad, ah, and some were just kind of wait, racing games. Wait, you, you, should, you should move Secret Rings to the mid tier. There is no mid tier. There was no middle ground. <laughs> but they, they had some uh, stumblings. So obviously, at this point, uh, approval ratings for Sonic were just really going through the going down in garbage. <laughs> And then the Sonic team went, what if we just consulted a fan at random for the game? Yeah. And they picked like the one good fan because we got Sonic Mania. <laughs> a game made by people who cared about Sonic. Yeah, it was, a, it was a love letter Sonic. And then they consulted some other fans and we got Sonic Forces. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, they really wanted to just raid all their wallets, so they just made a furry generator and called it a game. Because <laughs> yeah. that's what people wanted. Not, not against a furry generator, against spending $60 for a furry generator, just to be clear. But the, the modern Sonic didn't just stop at the games. They decided to do some movies. We can't do that. We saw these, you know they weren't really Sonic movies. They were Eggman movies because we loved Dr. Robotnik in these. They just, Sonic was just kind of there. Or, they, they did have another singular, singular problem, though, Max, that you want to talk about. I don't. I don't think they're that good, honestly. Like, the first movie is just a road movie, and they could replace Sonic with anybody, and it would be the same plot. Okay, but the uh, second movie's good. No, here's, here's my problem with the second movie. They made me want to fuck Knuckles the Echidna. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just casually drop Idris Elba in a movie. This is 3,000 years of longing for an echidna. I'm not about that. I'm not sure what's worse that they're putting Keanu as Shadow the Hedgehog in three. Hey, can you please move the slide on? I'm getting too excited. And then, of course, one of the more recent outings, we had Breath of the Sonic. Yeah. It took five years to copy uh, Tears of the Kingdom when it took uh, Genshin Impact to three years. Um, so playing through it just feels like a cheap Breath of the Wild copy. You know, collectibles, puzzles, speeds, kind of spread out everywhere. And then a goddamn leveling system based on the goddamn puzzles for no reason. Why, why do you have a leveling system in a Sonic game? And they just stole the piano riffs. And the final boss fight was a quick time event with three button presses. You know Sonic only uses one button. <laughs> Anyways. As, as much ups and downs as Sonic has over the years, the one thing has remained rock solid, and of course, is the music. From the classics, like Sonic Boom, that still lives in my head to this day, to City Escape, you know, music was honestly something they just rocked at. How did they do it? Well, to, for that, we have to talk about the musical inspiration for Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. I don't think you guys are aware of, like, the history of Sonic the Hedgehog. He's not inspired by these guys. His inspiration is Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, man, Th this, is, this, is, this is where Sonic's musical inspiration comes. But, you know, that's fine, because uh, Jun Shino, he started working at Sega around that time, and in 1993, he became the lead composer for Sonic 3 and Knuckles. So... It's good that we have at least one non-problematic musician in that game. That's, that's promising, right? Uh, so in addition to Sonic games, he started working on uh, various racing games because I mean, you, if, if you have a guitar like that, you have to do music for a racing game. That's just the rule. Like, what else is he going to make music for? Harvest Moon? I don't, I don't know, man. Uh, anyway, after Sonic 3 Knuckles, there's Drought of Sonic games. Uh, June was too hardcore to write music for some like shitty new IP like Nights into Dreams. And not nearly hardcore enough to write music for Echo the Dolphin. What? <laughs> that game, dude, that game's brutal. You don't even know. Uh, so with no franchise to work on, he, he knew he had to go and find his vocalist. So he went to America. And, uh, you know, he, he met his guy, I don't even know. Johnny Gioli. Yeah, Johnny Gioli. I don't know what's up with my slides. Uh, you know, shut up, Max. Uh, and together they wrote the strongest song, the, the best Sonic track ever written, that people tell me, Open Your Heart, is that it? Yeah! Yeah. 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 But you know, but sh shut up, we'll get, we'll get there. We'll get there. But first, why are they Crush 40? Um, I, I don't know, the name of a band is important. Be it your childhood nickname due to a medical condition, your favorite plant, or that book you saw when you were hanging out with your friend. <laughs> Uh, Crush 40, though, used the AIM screen name generator approach, combining June's favorite soda, Crush, 
and vocalist Johnny Gioli's age, 40. <laughs> That's like if I was still going by like Classic Gamer 14 or something, I don't know. Uh, so now, now that you know they've dropped Open Your Heart, uh, they're not gonna ride off into the sunset. They're gonna keep releasing music. So with Sonic Adventure 2, they come back and write the greatest song for the franchise ever written, Escape from the City. Wait, Max, that, that wasn't actually them. Yeah, um, Ted Poley did the vocals. So it wasn't official Crush so 40. So that is not Crush 40. That's not a Crush 40 song. No. No. Yeah, uh, Ted Poley did vocals. It's not officially Crush 40, but you know, we got Live and Learn, so that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, yeah, so next we had Sonic Heroes. They wrote music for that, but like, it's Sonic Heroes, so who gives a shit? Yeah. Uh, then they decided to make a game that uh, really comes from the heart. Uh, you know, one of one of the most heart, like, just, you know, rough, emotionally raw, so I'm fucking kidding, they wrote I Am All Of Me for Shadow the Hedgehog. Uh, which, I don't know, I think that's a, a much better mid-2000s emo song than whatever these guys were cooking up. So after that, um, they, they, did, they did some other movies. They did a live concert on my birthday, which was pretty cool. And then um, they, they tried to come back to the franchise, but uh, it, it didn't work out. Because at this point, once we got to the 2010s, Sonic started switching over to just, you know, Band of the Week. Yeah. And, Which uh, is cool sometimes, but they put Hoobas Tank in Sonic Forces, and I don't really want new metal in my games, so. Uh, so of course. I stand by that. We can't talk about Sonic without briefly, briefly touching on the fandom. By which, uh, we, this panel isn't 18 plus, so I'm not gonna talk about it, because you, you, you guys called it out earlier. You know what kind of fan art exists. It's terrible, it's tragic, and uh, honestly, we'd love to get rid of Sonic, but he's just in everything now, so you can't get rid of him. You um, can't win. So, as much as we'd, we'd love to blow up Sonic, we can't because he's honestly a fantastic quarantine effect because all of the weird fandom stuff stays within Sonic. <laughs> you saw the last time they got out. So, I mean, Sega even knows they need to kill him and they can't. <laughs> but don't you worry, they're gonna keep making Sonic stuff for literally ever. We got a third live action I'm worried. Uh, yeah, that's easy. We got Keanu Reeves now. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that. That's uh, very conflicting feelings. But uh, thank you for coming to our panel. Uh, we had a good time yelling at you for the last while. Uh, oh we God. hope you had fun. So uh, we have a lot of other panels. So many other panels. Uh, you, so if you laughed at all, you should come to all of these. Yeah, don't do that. 